We made a good decision here, okay? <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Um, this is part of my what I call Successful Christian Formula Series. Today we're going to be talking about, if you're going to give it a title, Adding to Your Faith. Adding to Your Faith, okay? So let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1. We'll read verses 1 through 10. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Now, just things I want to point out as I go through here. Uh, these are letters, okay? This one's a letter written by Peter, and he's writing to believers. It's always good to know the context and the content of what you're reading. And he claims to be a servant of Jesus Christ. And no matter how great these apostles got, and Peter was one of the greatest, one of the first, they always considered themselves a servant. And in our vernacular, it's actually slave. What we understand to be slave, most time when you read servant, it's slave. That's mentality. We good? Slave mentality. Okay, and he, uh, these guys always recognized that. These guys had walked with God. Okay? They always consider them, themselves his slave before anything else. And I want to point out righteousness of God and our Savior. That's a seven-letter Savior. Just like to throw these little pieces of truth out there. The number seven is the number of perfection. When you read your King James Bible, the Savior is I-O-U-R. Seven-letter Savior. Okay, I don't spell Savior six-letter like they do today. It's just certain things you kind of notice through the years. Verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you. Grace always comes before peace. God's grace comes before peace. This world wants peace, but they don't want God's grace. They want peace on their terms. Like, you know, we say during Christmas, whatever people believe about Christmas, you know, they say, peace on earth, goodwill to man. But they don't sing glory to God. Glory to God. Okay? Um, verse 3, according to his, as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Everything we need to know about living on this planet, living in these bodies, living as Christians, is already here. You've got to read it. And you read it year after year, day after day, you're going to start realizing and seeing some things whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. He has promised us so many things. And if we read his word, study his word, live for him, we become partakers of those promises. And listen, we all get in the flesh. I get in the flesh and we forget about the promises. We see all the negative. We see all the problems. And there's plenty of them. We all have them. But... When we get in God's word, we understand his promises, we remind ourselves of his promises, and if there was no other promise except that ye have been born again, ye have a home in heaven, that's all the promises we need. I mean, you think about it. Listen, there, people are being tortured, killed, hurt, taken, enslaved this moment, okay? And God's people has always suffered persecution, and they've been tormented, and they've been killed. Okay, listen, if, if the rest of your life was spent being tormented and hurt and beat up every day, okay, it'd be worth it because it's just for a moment. It's easy to say it's true, but the promise that we have eternal life and we live 75, 80, 90, 100 years on this earth is just, just imagine this is eternity. You know what your life is on this earth? Beep. Beep. That's your life right there. Beep. Little vapor. Little morning vapor you see in the morning. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Verse 5. Now here's what we're going to focus on. <clears throat> and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge, temperance. To temperance, patience. To patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. 
and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you at abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if ye do these things, ye shall never fail. Let's pray again. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to preach your word, to teach your word. I pray that you'd help our church, help those that are still not up here this morning. Lord, that you would guide them and help them to see they need to be up here. Help me in my thoughts, in my words, that they would glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, diligence. Let's look at the word diligence. Diligence means earnest in accomplishing, promoting, or striving after anything. You are earnestly trying to accomplish these things, and in this text, adding these things to your faith. You are earnest about it. You are striving it. It is not haphazard. Okay? You don't get up in the morning willy-nilly. You may or may not read your Bible. Okay? This isn't... Listen, if you get up and, and you have a little, a little devotional book, I want to encourage you, and that's all you're doing, you're not where you need to be. Okay? If, if all you do is maybe read a few verses of Scripture, you're not doing what you need to do. You need to be earnestly contending, earnestly striving. You're diligent about putting this. Are you wondering where your faith is? Are you wondering why you don't, why you don't have passion, or you don't have compassion, or you don't have power, or you don't have wisdom, or you don't know how to get past your problems? Maybe because you're not being diligent about your walk with the Lord. You've got to put time into it. That old song, take time to be holy. Listen, I don't have all the answers, but I do strive by God's grace. I strive to enter in. I, I buffet my flesh, as, the, as Paul said. You know, a lot of us, what we do is we, we buffet our flesh. You know, we like to go to the buffets, but we don't buffet, meaning we don't beat up. We don't, we don't put our body into subjection. That's just a joke, a pun off a word, you know, okay? But you have to diligently be about it. It's... Listen, when you're brand new in the faith, one, two, three years old, yeah, it looks like everything's new. The sky's bluer than it's ever been. The, the sounds of the birds are prettier than they've ever been. Everything seems good and right. Because God's doing that, you're a new babe in Christ. Everything's new. But once you start walking with the Lord 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years down the road, you're supposed to be an adult. And he's not going to show up in your life as much as he used to. Just like you as parents, you're totally and completely involved in your children's life when they're born, right? Your baby can't take care of himself. They can't feed themselves. They can't bathe themselves. They can't do that. You're totally involved in their life. But the older they get, they're supposed to be more independent, right? Right? By the time they're five years old, yes, you are still very much involved in their life, but you don't have to be there every waking moment, correct? By the time they're 13 years old, hopefully they got a little bit of a work ethic, and, you're trying, and they're not just playing video games all the time. You're actually working them. I had my son out here with me yesterday working. Okay, I couldn't have done the job that I had to do. Man, some, sometimes the way that people make furniture years ago, these oblong, heavy, this is a like a six-foot hutch. Looked like it was made out of solid oak. It was in a diamond shape, five feet wide. I needed help. And my 13-year-old boy was there to help, amen? But then they got to start getting 15 and 16 years old. You know, listen, we got to raise the expectations of our kids. We really do. 100 years ago, when they were 12 and 13 years old, you know what kids were doing? They were running the family farm. They were running the family store. They were driving. No issues. Mom and dad could leave. 
for a week or two. Even if it was just to go someplace for two days, they had to be gone for a week just because of the way travel was. They could leave their 12-year-old boy, their 13-year-old girl, to run the store and run the farm. Okay, we need to raise the expectations. So we get older. Man, by the time you're 21, really, man, you ought to be just a productive member of society. And your parents aren't there. You're probably out of the house by then, right? Parents ain't looking for you. You're not looking for them. You're there if they call. You're there for some advice. They, they, you're there for them to stop by sometimes and you give them a meal. But it's not every day involved in their life. You probably pray for them every day. You may talk to them every day. But then they get married. They have their own family. You're getting less and less involved in their life. By the time they're in their 30s and 40s, you might rarely hear from your kids. But you want to be there and you are there when they do call. That's how it is with God. You've been in this thing 30, 40 or more years. He's not going to show up. Listen, who here as parents has experienced a, a, an older child calling you, asking for advice, and you felt compelled not to give it? Anybody like that? You felt compelled not. I think I'm going to leave this one up to you. You know what I'm saying? And you might have even known the answer. You might have known what was best. But you decided because of the circumstance, the feel of your child talking to you, you felt, I'm going to leave this one up to you. And they may get mad at you. Or you know they did something wrong, and they know they did something wrong, and they're asking your approval, and you don't say anything. Are you seriously asking me what you, if this is right? That's how God is with us. So you're di the only way you're going to get that with him is you're diligently adding to your faith, and he doesn't have to show up in your life for you to keep serving him. Listen, I want God to show up in my life. I want, I want miracles. I want the lightning bolts. You know, I want the, the sign in the sky. But you know how he talks to me sometimes? When I can't get a bolt to fit inside this power washer, and I am resisting everything I got to throw that thing. And I look at my son, I said, let's pray about this, man. This has got me crazy. Lord, I cannot get this bolt right. Show me. Open it up. Less than three seconds later, I got that bolt in. Now, yeah, I got a whole lot of big things I'm praying about for me and my family. Those are what I really want. And that's when, when God did that to me that day, I actually said to him, so you got to be kidding me, Lord. I know you did this for me, but you know, I really want my home restored. <laughs> That's what I really want. I'm glad you did this for me, but I'd rather you do that for me. You know what I'm saying? I believe your personal relationship with the Lord just ought to be like that, where you can just, now you just sit down and talk to him. <sighs> Sometimes you cry. Sometimes that's all you do. Lord, I don't know what you're doing. I don't like what you're doing. I don't approve of what you're doing. But you are God. And I'm a worm. Help me to be faithful. Amen? Oh, I... Anybody here a Star Trek fan? <laughs> I keep my phone on a little bit longer when pastor's not here, just in case I miss a message, so let's turn this off. Oh, and as a general rule, just so you all know, I, for years, I never brought my phone into the church. Okay? I didn't do it when I first got here. Okay? I don't bring electronics to the pulpit. Okay? It's God's written word. Amen. I read and preach from God's written word not from an electronic device. And I believe you can be two hours without your phone. Leave your phone in your car. Yeah. Okay. Bring your Bible to the church. Leave your phone in the car. That being said, I didn't do it for years. I, for years, I just left it in the car. I did not bring it. The only time I would bring it in is if it was like a special meeting, a special singing. I wanted to record it. I do it more now just because my responsibilities are more here. Like I got to be able to view things on my phone, like for YouTube or whatnot, when other guys ain't here, different things like that. Or if I'm the only one here, pastor can get a hold of me. That's the only reason I do it. Just something to think about. Okay, that's part of growing in faith. Amen. All right. Amen. What are you striving after?
What are you striving after? Make notes of it. What am I striving after? So that's diligent. Now let's look at faith. What is faith? It's conviction of the truth. We know what the truth is. We live in a day and age where truth is relative. Truth does not matter. That's your personal truth. That might be true for you, but that's not my personal truth. Truth is truth. It matters not what you believe. Now, I'm not talking about something like, hey, a guy wears blue jeans all the time, or a guy wears um, ripcord jeans all the time. Okay? In that circumstance, a guy may say, yeah, I tried denim, it don't work for me. And the other guy says, I tried ripcord, it don't work for me. Okay, the ripcord jeans might be true for you, but they're not true for me. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about truth and fact based upon God and his word. That never changes. Our belief about it never changes. And we've got to get more strong in this day and age. And, man, listen, we live in this, this where people are just confused. And they need somebody, Christian people, who have enough of God on them who can say kindly but sternly, that's not true. Okay? Gender is a fact. God made you a boy. God made you a girl. It matters not what you do, what you think, what pronoun you want to use. It doesn't matter what physical alterations you make to your body. It's not true. And they keep coming up with more and more definitions that don't make any sense. We need to stand for truth. And that faith is that conviction of that truth. Listen, if, I, if I'm working side by side, somebody that's, the world's term is a homosexual, the biblical term is a sodomite, okay? And they're with me, and I know they are, and they want to be in my face about it, I'm going to say kindly, don't do that. It's a wicked lifestyle. God loves you, and I love you, but that is a wicked lifestyle. I'll work with you, I'll be beside you, but just keep that to yourself. We need to lovingly and sternly speak the truth. Okay? We need to lovingly speak the truth. So diligence, faith. Hebrews 11.1, 1, who can quote that? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Listen, this Christian life, you can't see most of it. You, we can't see God. It's like we can't see wind. And people want to say, well, you can't see God. I don't believe in him. Well, you can't see wind. Do you believe in the wind? I can't see the electricity. Do you believe in the electricity? Okay, we got to be able to combat these, this foolishness in the world. But you can only get that way if you're diligently adding to your faith these things. Virtue. What is virtue? Moral excellence. Let's go to Philippians 4.8. Philippians 4.8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, moral excellence in you, if there be any praise, think on these things. Okay, we are bombarded with, with sickness, disease, immorality in this world. And if all we do is focus on that, we're going to live defeated lives. Okay, that's why I do, not, I, I do not watch the news. I don't follow the news. Every once in a while a certain topic will come up. I'll look it up. But the bottom line is most of what you're seeing out there is just, is just propaganda, lies, wickedness, foolishness, stupidity. Amen. Okay? And you, get, and you can give your life to watching that stuff. And even the stuff that's true, it's so bad. Why are you going to give yourself to that? Think on these things. Think on these things. Virtue. Add to your faith virtue. To virtue, add knowledge. What is knowledge? It's a general and deeper knowledge of our Christian religion. 
Are you growing in your knowledge of your Christian faith? Are you farther along today than you were last year? Are you farther along today than you were two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, ten years ago? I'm going to promote, or at least bring out, that I think there are some in this room that were a whole lot farther along in their walk with the Lord ten years ago than they are today. Just in the year and a half I've been here, I've seen slippage. There's people in this church, men in this church, women in this church, they're not doing what they could do. They're not reaching their full potential. You're not growing. You're just skating. Add to your faith virtue. You've got to be diligent about it. You've got to diligently add to your virtue knowledge. Are you growing in your knowledge of God and ministry and people? Are you growing? Do you understand lawful and unlawful for Christians? Listen, we don't have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. I fail every day. But you know what? I'm farther along than I was eight years ago. I'm farther along than I was five years ago. I'm farther along than I was two years ago. And I can tell you by God's grace, I'm farther today than I was last year. Because by his grace... I'm in his word every day. I'm striving to defeat my flesh. I give in to the flesh every day. I sin every day. I get mad every day in in an unrighteous way. But the bent of my life is toward God. He's not looking for perfection. You're never going to get there. But are you striving? Are you better? Are you adding to your life these things? The right kind of knowledge in 1 Corinthians 8, 1 tells us that it just puffs up. Okay, it's real easy, and it happens all the time. There, there are people in this world now, in this church, I believe, that there's people in the past. They've got a lot of knowledge about this book. They might have a lot of scripture memorized. They might know a lot of truth. They might be able to have a spiritual conversation with you. But your contribution to others... There's nothing. You're not pleasing Christ. you got a lot of knowledge, and you may love him, but you're just kind of puffed up. Listen, the more we read this, it ought to cause us to sacrifice our life, our time, for others and for the cause of Christ. If all we're doing is stuff for ourselves, we're just bottlenecking the grace of God. It's like we're the Dead Sea. All this good is coming into you. Well, listen, guys, you're getting good truth today. Amen. And, and even if I get mad at you and I say something in frustration, it's still true. But you need to pray for me that I don't get that way. But we all have those moments, right? But truth is truth. And the more we're in this word... It ought to change us and cause us to do something for this church, to do something for this community. It ought to motivate us. It ought to move us. Man, that dead, that dead, you know why it's the Dead Sea? Because the rivers run into it, but nothing flows out of it. And it's a stinky, nasty thing. And there are some very dark, unimaginable creatures that do live in the Dead Sea. We don't want to be that way. Temperance. Temperance, self-control, and I'll be honest, it's probably one of my weakest ones. We all got desires, fleshly desires, staying in the bed longer, watching something we shouldn't watch. I'll, t- I'll tell you, I'm, okay, this, I'm, this is good, this is good. You can make a bunch of willful decisions to do right. You can. You might be that person that when you make the decision to will it, It's going to happen. And you don't need any help from God. You may have that personality. But most of us don't. 
Now, there are some things I can, I can will. I can will not to put sugar in my coffee. Even though I like sugar in my coffee, I like to drink coffee. It puts too much weight on me. I've lost 40 pounds this last year. I don't want to go back. I use stevia. Stevia don't taste as good as sugar by far. But I've gotten used to it, and it helps keep my body slim. When I go a week, three or four days, when I run out of stevia and I use sugar, I gain five pounds that week. Somebody made cake here last week. I ate a piece of cake. I gained eight pounds that week. With my coffee and that piece of cake, I threw the other pieces away. So, yeah, I have a willpower. But it don't have to be that way. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm telling you, you are giving yourself away. I am giving myself away. By how you act and certain things you say and certain, certain things you do and don't do. By your faithfulness to church. Love me, but being on time on your own up here when church starts. Not roaming around outside, not driving in late. That's a mark of maturity. I love you all, but that's just true. Okay? I'm, so keep loving me, amen? But we're growing. But... You're giving yourself away when you do those types of things that you are not in God's word. Or if you're in God's word, all you're doing is building knowledge. You're not letting it get into you. You're getting in the word, but you're not letting the word get into you. I'm, I'm, the older I get, the more I'm convinced. Christianity is giving themselves away, and Christianity today is so weak because you are not reading your Bible. You can say you are, and you might be in it five minutes a day, but I'm telling you, the mass majority of Christians are not reading their Bibles. And they were, there were preachers 50 years ago saying, I believe 80% of the people in our churches aren't even saved. They were saying that 80 years ago. Because if you're in your word, if you're in his word, and you're letting him grow you up, it's going to show up. It's going to show up. There's going to be life in you. Listen. Oh, well, I'm growing. I'm growing. I've told you this before. I think I'll say it again. I've seen too many 60-year-old babies. Okay? You know, it's discouraging to be a 21-year-old man that's still prideful and arrogant, who, who talks with a 60-year-old man who's more prideful and arrogant and a bigger baby than I ever was. That's frustrating. And then you grow up and you look at these guys 70, 80 years. You ain't grown up. You're still... Listen, there was a man in the church I was going to one time. We had an issue he had to talk to me about. or I had, I, He wasn't talking to me, so I decided, hey, i got to talk to him about it. I talked to the pastor. Yeah, you need to talk to him. He's 60 years old. And so I got there early. I was doing the song, setting up the sound system. And as I walked back, he was sitting in the dark in the sound booth that was up here, just sitting there. So I was up there preparing or whatnot, and he was just watching me. Okay? And as I walked by, I said, oh, hey, John. Hey, we need to talk, don't we? He says, oh, you don't want to talk to me. I said, okay, John. Later on, I think we discussed something. He didn't like the portrayal of it. I was walking down the hallway where the Sunday school's room, the hall lights are off, the sun, there's nothing going on back there. I'm walking by, and in the corner of that dark Sunday school room is John sitting in a chair. You know how y'all get when you pout, right? You go in a room, you sit, you quiet, you just pout. Listen, we need to grow up. You grow up. We're not going to be perfect, but we ought to be growing. Amen. We ought to be growing. And listen, you see, we see plenty of dead animals on the road, right? And if they're left there, say you see an elk on the road Monday morning, been recently hit. If it's still there four days later, is it a little bigger? Yeah, it's bigger. It's bloating. It's growing, but it's dead. Amen. Take that home. That's good stuff. Oh, I got to tell this story. Part of what I do is pest control, rodent control, all that stuff. And two years ago before I came out here, some lady called me and said something got up in her vent, her floor vent. And I went there and looked at it, and it was like at 6 o'clock at night. And it was... I didn't know what it was then, but it was a groundhog. Got up into her four-inch vent and couldn't get out. Crawl spaces are abundant out in Tennessee. And the, the, the piping gets broken, and they get up in there looking for heat. He got up, he wedged himself up, but couldn't get out. Now, this was not a normal 
even a normal four inch bend, most are six inches. Okay, some of them are four. But then even at the top, you got at least a like a four by twelve vent. This was like this was just like a two by six vent. And I got underneath it. I was going to try to pull him out of there. But the way they'd done the floor is they added a second subfloor. I couldn't even reach him because there was, there was a piece of board here that I couldn't get up to get him. And I'm thinking, Lord, what am I going to do to get this stinking thing out of here without doing a reconstruction? Taking out her floor just to get this thing out. And so I told her, I said, this is too late tonight for me to do anything with it. We'll do it in the morning. And I prayed about it and asked the Lord, Lord, what? And listen, for me, the nastier, the better sometimes. I said, Lord, how am I going to do this? He, he told me. I think been up there four days. He's bloated. The Lord gave me an idea. I went there the next day with pliers and a knife. Can you imagine what I did? I'm down there stabbing that thing. He shrunk up real quick. He stunk, but he shrunk up real quick. And I pulled him up by his mouth and some pliers, and I was skinning him while I was bringing him up. And I took him home and ate him. No, I didn't. Okay, listen. You might be, in the world's eyes, growing, but you can still be dead. And you're just puffed up. You're filling yourself up with knowledge, but you're not growing in maturity in Christ. You're not growing in his grace. You're just getting puffed up. I might hit one more point here. <laughs> well, I'll just go over them quickly. Temperance, that's self-control. You're not controlled by your feelings. Maybe I'll just stop here. We have got to learn to quit being controlled by your feelings. Listen, God gave them to us. Okay, listen. The world and world religions, even Christian religions, comes up with all kinds of things that they think are right. Okay? Examples. There are Christian religions out there. They love God, and that's why they're doing it. They only eat bland food. They don't believe you're supposed to enjoy your food. If that's the case, we just got to think common sense about it. If that's the case, why did God give us taste buds? God wants us to enjoy our food. Okay? People want to go out and have sex with everybody. Sex is a great thing. And God invented it. It's beautiful but within the confines of marriage. It's not wrong to want it, but do it God's way. There are groups of people out there, they only wear plain clothes. I understand that. I might come to the point, because I knew a pastor who did it, I might do it. Where I, for services, I might come with just one suit all the time, just to help me stay humble. Okay? But there are groups out there that only wear white and black. They don't think you should enjoy colors. If that's the case, why did God give us eyes? Why did God give us the colors? Why did he give us the rainbow? we got to be common sense about this stuff. But we cannot be controlled by our emotions. God gave us those emotions. And they serve a purpose. They do. But we have to learn to control them with the power of the Spirit in a right way. This is why we have so many problems, so many things that are being approved of and done in our country because of emotion. They're not thinking about it logically. They're not thinking about it faithfully. They're, it's all emotion. Their emotion gets them to think abortion is okay. Their, um, it gets them to think that that's just a fetus. It gets them to change the definition of murder. Emotion. Your emotion, I was born this way. No, you weren't. You weren't. It's all emotional. And we've got to be steadfast as Christian believers with grace on our lives and sometimes stern. We, we've got to get in our mind that it's just not always lovey-dovey. Let me say that. It's always love. It's always love. If we're, be, if we're browbeating people up and we don't have love, we're wrong. But if we've got love, we can be straightforward and stern sometimes. Your kid runs out into the street. You don't say, hey, Johnny. Johnny, don't do that, Johnny. Johnny, don't go to the streets! You said it in love, but you said it with some sternness. We've got to learn to be that type of Christian. The same Jesus we talked about that loves the world, died on the cross for our sins, was the same guy that put a whip together and turned over the tables in the temple. We've got to understand that balance. 
I got four more points, but we are going. Whew, that went fast. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for the day. Preaching and teaching of your word. We ask that you'd help us the rest of this day. Help our pastor. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, ten, about eight more minutes. Let's try to be up here on time this time, please. Thank you.